Did you guys know that Kohei Horikoshi, the guy behind Boku no Hero, had two previous series serialized in Weekly Shonen Jump? Like, no kidding, seriously, there was Crazy Zoo, which had Ochako hanging out with King Kazuma from Summer Wars. It started back in 2010 and it lasted for a year, but it was pretty unique conceptually. A year later, in 2012, he would go on to make Barrage, which was also known as Ball Throw in Japan. This one also had another Ochako variant, but she kinda looked like Hatsume as well. This one only lasted 4 months, but our boy Horikoshi was not deterred. And a little under 2 years later, Horikoshi dropped a Boku no Hero, and Hot Topic was never the same. It's genuinely fascinating to read a mangaka's older, less popular works before they made it big. Another example is Hungry Joker, made by Black Clover's mangaka Yuki Tabata. Though, as you could probably guess from the title and the thumbnail of this video, I wanted to focus on the past works of Gege Akutami, the creator of Jujutsu Kaisen. I think it goes without saying by looking at my profile picture on pretty much anything that I'm a big fan of the series, and as such, I've read Jujutsu multiple times and also looked at Gege's other work. I haven't really seen videos that touched upon the four other one-shots that Gege made, so I figured I'd talk about them. I guess a bit of a heads up is that each of these one-shots are one chapter and 44 pages each, give or take, so I'll just be summarizing all of them here. If you don't want any spoilers, then you can just click out and go read them yourself. I'll have the names of the manga in the description. But with that out of the way, we got Kamishiro Sosa, released on May 7th of 2014. It starts off with two cops being sent to an island to figure out what exactly is cooking. And it turns out, it's the island's residence. There's Ganji, named after Gandhi and Sanji, both being characters from One Piece. There's also a Serpa, aka Suzu Amamiya, who is lovingly referred to as the mascot character. It's heartwarming to see that the police numbers in Japan are dwindling to the point that they need to resort to hiring child soldiers now. They both manage to finagle their way through the dome that is covering the entire town and they meet up with Reko, a native that's willing to deal with their chicanery. The people of the town worship Guji-sama, named after Yuji, but this is a problem as Ganji and Suzu are actually gods, and they see Guji being referred to as a god, and they go, hey, wait a minute. The gods, or kami as they're referred to, aren't like these bloodborne-esque beings that are incomprehensible, but in reality, they're just average guys that got one or two cool techniques or something that can lead to them being revered as a deity. Suzu herself is able to conjure up dolls, and since this sort of thing can be seen as a miracle, Suzu can be worshipped as a kami, but in reality, she's just a human. It's a really creative system, and it kind of reminds me a bit of the Jinki from Gachiakata, where it would have items that hold meaning to their owners that lend them power. But in the case of Kami Shirososa, Kami have god weapons. Ganji has a sword, and Suzu demonstrates her aforementioned dolls to Reko. And Reko herself has a... <laughs> uh, she has one hell of an outfit. Part of the joy of reading Amakaka's earlier works is that you can compare their present self to their past self. It's really cute. Cause like look here, Rekka got a tank top, she's showing off her boobs, she got a high rise dong, she got booty shorts. But then you compare her to the woman of Jujutsu Kaisen, where you have men and women trying to kill each other. And it's just a really great evolution. The manic expressions Ganji makes reminds me of Gojo, which is really cute to see. Guji himself has a mask that makes him look like Flutter from Hana Hunter, but given how Jujutsu is very clearly inspired by Hana Hunter, it makes a lot of sense. After an altercation, they figure out that the giant lid covering the island was part of Guji's god weapon, as his weapon is a cooking pot. Of course, it's kind of difficult to cook things without your fingers, so Ganji makes quick work of Guji's fingers. These names kind of suck ass, but then again, Jujutsu has characters such as Gojo, Geto, Jogo, Toto, and Choso, so whatever. Oh yeah, uh, by the way, I lied earlier. Yeah, see, Suzu's god weapon isn't necessarily dolls, it's people, and Ganji is an immortal person she was able to cook up. It's a really neat twist, you know, you got a young girl traveling with her swordsman bodyguard. Again, it's like Golden Kamui, but like modern day and still insane. It's been a hot minute since I've read this one shot, but I really enjoyed it upon my reread. 
The god weapon system is super fun, and I just love the idea of the gods just being normal people with a special power. Part of me thinks that Gege ended up reusing the god weapon idea with cursed weapons and jujutsu, but it's just all speculation. Reading Gege's earlier works as well as early chapters of jujutsu is really interesting because their style used to be relatively clean, but it only seemed to grow more sketchy and manic with time. Honestly, I like it a lot though, I think the new style rocks. Either way, Kamishiro Sosa is a fun, quick read, and I can suggest it to anyone. Uh, Reko doesn't really do anything, but eh, it's fine. Next on the agenda is number 9, the sequel to Kaiju number 8, which in itself is a sequel to Killer7. This one is gonna be confusing, so uh, listen up. There's two one-shots of the same name, both by Gege, but one was published in Shonen Jump Next, and one was published in Shonen Jump. I'll go in order and start with the Jump Next one, which was published on May 1st of 2015. It's here that we see one of the earliest instances of Gege's persona, the freak cat cyclops thing. He also states his favorite manga is Taizo Mote King Saga, which I've never heard of in my life, but apparently when I looked it up, the main character looks like Onigiri, and it has a page on the JoJo wiki apparently. Anyways, back to Greg, you got this girl named Nae, and she can see ghouls and goblins. She steals herself off in a kindergarten, and it's up to Tsukumo Hiramasa, aka Nine, to go check on her. Tsukumo is a name that would end up being reused in Jujutsu, so that's kinda fun. Nine is funny as hell, bro. The teacher is like, Nae is grieving over the loss of her parents and the death of her grandpa, and Nine is busy like eating rocks and playing kickball with kids. Nae suspects her grandpa was actually killed by a ghoul, and Nine is like, damn, shot. Body, I think you're right. The ghouls in this series are known as eerie, and they are referred to as the quote, backside of a human. This reminds me of curses in Jujutsu, pretty much consisting of negative emotions that humans have, now in a corporeal form. Most people have eerie that look like the yellow devil from Mega Man, but those with weirdo eerie are able to see other eerie. You know, personally speaking, I think one thing that Gege was always fantastic at was writing dialogue between characters, and like that's present here in this one shot. I love how Nine is like, yeah, when we catch the dude that killed your grandpa, we'll send him to super jail, and Nae is like, nah, kill him. And Nine is like, damn, Pencil, I see your point, you are right. Earlier I said Ganji reminded me of Gojo in the previous series, but damn, does Nine really remind me of Gojo in terms of his behavior and his physical appearance? Nine drops Nae home before his buddy Yaotome informs him that Nae's grandpa was actually really well off and also a victim of dementia. One person took advantage of his illness and was able to weasel their way onto the family registry, with that person being Nae's kindergarten teacher, Aiba. She spills some details about Nine, specifically how he was a fella that relentlessly killed quote unquote villains. Ibert decided to square up with Nai, but this is a grown woman fighting a child, so genuinely who do you think won? Also, it turns out Iba's ability is data compression. I don't get what's up with Gege and compression, because like earlier in Kamishiro Sosa, Guji uses his pot to compress Ganji, so it's like, does, does Gege have like a cube fetish or something? Anyways, Aiba is about to kill a literal kindergartner before Nine comes busting through and he goes nah uh and starts squaring up. Aiba's ability is really creative, pretty much allowing her to compress and decompress objects like telephone poles and poisonous gas, whereas Nine got the power of magnets and god on his side. Using the power of our lord and savior, Nine is able to bust through Aiba's defenses and is about to handle her before Nai tries enacting revenge. Nine tells her you have no enemies in this world and she goes fine, I guess. This one ends with Nai choosing to spare her grandpa's killer and Nine deciding to employ a literal kindergartner. I haven't read this one before this video, but I thought it was fine. Nothing revolutionary, but it had a fun premise with a manic protagonist. He still had his morals and tried providing some semblance of guidance, but he also employed a child to help him fight ghosts, so I don't know if, if he was bad or not. It is really neat though, seeing Gege's ideas for curses manifest in this early stage. In addition to having main characters with a kind of grayish morality. The second iteration of number 9 was released on October 10th of 2015, and while it still has 9, it has a new female lead named Megumi. Greg just loves reusing names it seems, but I mean, what can you do man, it's hard. Megumi lives in Rakucho, a fairly normal town that has been referred to as Yakuza's town for some reason. She comes home one day and finds out that her dog has been smited by the wrath of God and a land shark is trying to get Megumi's mama to sell the property. The police are very useful and see the giant imprint left behind by the 16th Colossus and goes, we have no evidence, and she goes, thanks. 
Megumi is trying to mourn the loss of her dog, which was also named Redis for some reason, and then she bumps into Nine, who looks a lot like Yuji in this panel. Nine himself is beefing with a bold Yakuza before he drops a GameCube on him. Despite the 5 month time gap between the two one shots, Nine looks a lot more manic here, and I like it. Nine realizes that Megami can see Eerie, and immediately brings her to Yao Tome like a cat bringing you a dead mouse as a treat. Unlike the first one shot where it seemed like Nine was just a hitman, here it paints Nine as a member of the Yakuza looking to expand his reach. Gege has always been great at character dynamics, and I love how Nine and Yao Tome just bounce off of one another. Nine gives Megami the lowdown on how Eerie works, while she explains how her dog was vaporized. Nine's like, fine, I guess I'll help you out, and drops by Megami's home to wear her underwear on his head and terrorize her mom. Oh, and speaking of terrorism, the goon from earlier is back and decided that it wasn't enough that he smited Megami's dog and decides to go for her as well. This time, however, Nine is here, so the two just start beefing. I like how they're both Yakuza, but they both have different codes of conduct. It's some pretty cool world building. The medium of one shots is neat, cause you gotta try to tell a condensed story with the possibility of expanding it down the line. In a really cool move, Nine is able to utilize his cubes as like storage containers of sorts, kinda similar to how Okotsu would utilize Rika in Jujutsu. What ensues is a really sick fight, with flurries of blows and all sorts of weapons to boot. I love the fights in Jujutsu for feeling manic and hectic, and that energy was present from the very start. After flattening the goon like a pancake, Nine tells Megumi's mom, Home is where your daughter is, you big dumb stupid idiot, and her mom is like, Damn, you right. And then Nine walks off into the abyss. It's a bit of an anticlimactic ending, but all in all, I really enjoyed number 9, and I would have loved to have seen it receive a full adaptation, just to see what crazy antics everyone would be up to. But as it stands, these two were fun one-shots that served as fine, bite-sized stories that laid some of the groundwork for Jujutsu. Last on the agenda, we have Nikai Bongai Barubaru Jura, released on October 3rd of 2016. At this point, it really seems like Geki's art style has begun to bloom into what would later be used in Jujutsu Kaisen Zero and early portions of Jujutsu Kaisen. Like, no, look, the main character looks like Yuji with Megami's hair, and then the main girl is drawn similar to how Maki would appear in Zero. There's even a girl that looks like Maki but with Nobara's hair. The premise for this one is pretty simple. Basically, God came down one day and he said no more weapons, and humanity was like, fine, whatever. But now we have to worry about kaiju. Thankfully, Japan has a kaiju named Mask Man that helps fend off invading kaiju, which, in terms of design, really do resemble the curses in Jujutsu. We then see our Yuji Megami hybrid, Naroma, about to square up with a bunch of goons. This jump kick that Naroma does is literally the same exact thing that Yuji does in Chapter 1 of Jujutsu. It's great, I love it. Naroma is able to wipe the floor with these goons, and he's also kind of invincible, which again reminds me of Yuji and his inhumane strength. Whereas Yuji lives with his grandpa, Naroma lives with his grandma, but both love them very much. Naroma is just kind of chilling eating lettuce before Mask Man completely wipes out grandma's shop, which is <laughs> it's terrible, man, it sucks. Upon closer acceptance, Mask Man is actually being piloted by a girl that got big ol' eyebrows, and she's wearing spats, and you can see her panties. It's really funny seeing fan service in these one shots, especially given how like Jujutsu is currently. There's no time for fan service when you're fighting for your life. I love this bit here when Naroma helps out with a kid that's getting bullied and the kid keeps trying to thank him but Naroma gets pissed off. The pilot from before is a girl in Naroma's school, Nodoka, and I swear to god, <laughs> Gege gotta look up like baby names or something bro, he just uses the same letters for all these characters names. Nodoka lets us know that 15 years ago, after God told us to knock it off with the whole weapons thing, Kijin started being sent to attack mankind, with Kijin being like a special type of kaiju. The kaiju that mankind uses to fight back are Fukujin, like the one that was shown off before. Naroma is like, bro, you have never fought once in your life, and Nodoka is like, uh-uh, here, look at this ass shot, and also, yes I have, here, look at my wounds. They got no further time for discussion though, as a Kijin pulls up and starts terrorizing everyone. Nadoka is getting mollywopped by this Kijin before Naroma is like, hey, watch this, and he hops into the masked man's mouth. The two make up and tag out, with Naroma taking control and starting his beatdown. Just like Yuji, this freak of nature is able to take a beating like a champ and lay the beatdown onto this sad sack. What we get is an insane wrestling match between these two kaiju, ending with a superb suplex to end all of this off. It's stupid, it's goofy, it's really silly, it has a lot of heart, and I really, really love this one shot a lot. If I had to rank these one shots, I'd say definitely that this one was my favorite, followed by number 9 and ending with Kamishiro Sosa. 
The kaiju plus rustling action is super fun and charming, and it reminds me a lot of these recent bits from Dandadan. Naroma being a beta Yuji is really fun, and the one shot even ends by telling us to peep Jujutsu. Nine was a real interesting character, and I like the aspects of him that were carried over into Gojo, with Nine being kind of like a legend in the world of Hitman and all that stuff, and Gojo being, you know, Gojo. When this dude was born, he changed the fundamentals of the world. Ganji was funny, but I would have loved to see him be more fleshed out in his story. But I guess regardless of all of that, all of these one-shots are great in their own ways, and I really suggest anyone that's a fan of Jujutsu, check these ones out, definitely. It's really fascinating seeing ideas that were fleshed out in Jujutsu originate in these one-shots, and it's a shame that not too many people are even aware that these exist. In America, Tatsuki Fujimoto recently had all of his previous one-shots collected and published into two volumes, and I'd love to see Gage get that treatment as well. As of this recording, Jujutsu is still ongoing, and it could very well end this year or in 2024, but honestly, whatever Gage ends up doing, I will be there no matter what, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what he's been cooking. And on that note, this has been Ash, and I want to thank you guys for tuning in. Special thank you to my patrons, Big Boot Goddamn, Chills MP4, Delaner, Polaroid Jack, Sarah Lolita, Borpilus Vunny, Real Century, Luce, Fento, Sea Crowns, Kiwi Kiwi, V, Andrew, Graystar, Silgon, Amatera Misu, Logan, Sianaru, and Jiva. Thank you guys as always for your support, I love you all, and thank you guys for watching to the end of this video. Next week, I'm gonna do a strange manga I find video to close off the month of May and enter the month of June. I love you all, and I hope you guys have a great rest of your weekend. Take it easy. Me a hand.